Mimi Goodman, we're broadcasting from St. Paul, Minnesota, from the studios of St. Paul Neighborhood Network. We begin with a broadcast exclusive. Last August, just weeks before fall classes were set to begin, Debbie Almentasser was forced out as the founding principal of New York City's first public Arabic language school. At issue were Almentasser's comments in the New York Post when she explained the use of the word entefada, or uprising. The Post had questioned Almentasser because the word entefada appeared on a T-shirt of a woman's organization that sometimes used the offices of a community group where she was a board member. The T-shirt had nothing to do with her school, the Khalil Gibran International Academy. But Almentasser came under right-wing criticism for not denouncing the use of the word entefada on the T-shirt. She stepped down days later. On his radio program, live from City Hall with Mayor Mike and John Gambling, New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg welcomed Almantazer's departure. Principal resigned today. Did she? Yep. She, um, well, I know the woman. Uh, she's worked for the city in a variety of capacities. She's uh, a very Debbie smart, Al honest. She's certainly not a terrorist. Um, she really does care. And she said something a couple days ago. She got a question. She's not all that media savvy, maybe, and she tried to explain a word rather than just condemn. Uh, but I think she felt that she had become the focus uh, of, uh, rather than having the school of focus. And so today she submitted her resignation, which is nice of her to do. And I appreciate all her service, and I think she's right to do so. Uh, but now let's look to the future. In the months since Almantasser's case has become a major issue of free speech and anti-Arab racism in post-9-11 America, earlier this year, she filed a federal lawsuit accusing New York City officials of violating her right to free speech and conspiring to move her, remove her from her job. She was joined at the courthouse by dozens of supporters, including New York City Council Member Charles Barron. There's no reason why this sister shouldn't be the head of a school that she started, she founded, she gave life to. This is absurd. This is xenophobia. This is racism. This is disrespectful. And we are standing here today solidly behind her to say that not only should she be considered, she is the most qualified, the best qualified, and should be put in that position immediately. Immediately. On Sunday, Almantasser gave her first interview for a lengthy article on her case in the New York Times. Today, she joins us from our Firehouse studio in New York for her first national broadcast interview. Debbie Almantasser, we welcome you to Democracy Now! Thank you, Amy. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you for the wonderful coverage that you've given um, the Khalil Gibran International Academy last fall and now making it a, a national issue for people to better understand. Can you talk about why you stepped down, um, even though you were the one who spearheaded the founding of this school? As you had um, covered earlier uh, in August, the whole saga with the campaign smear against me and the New York Post uh, interview, that week of August 6, um, all of the support um, that I was receiving from the Department of Education, from New Visions for Public School, um, just became, you know, unapparent. Um, and I saw the withdrawal. And as of August 9th, um, city officials, as well as people from New Visions, met with me. And basically putting it, you know, in the words of, it's either you or the school. We will not move forward with the school if you do not resign. And as you may know, this school is a historical school in this country. It's the first of its kind to be a public school teaching Arabic and cultural studies. Um, and many people within New York City were looking forward to this school, the Arab American community, the broader community. And I could not put my personal interest ahead of the interest of the children that had already enrolled 44 students, the eight staff members that I had hired. Um, and this dream that many people had been waiting for. So I had no choice in the matter, um, as you could tell. How did you come up with the idea for the school? Um, as highlighted in the uh, New York Times article, um, the idea came from a New Visions um, representative who sought 
me out um, after speaking to people um, at the Department of Education, at the mayor's office, and the final place was on a grassroots level at a falafel stand in Brooklyn, um, where the last person recommended that he call me. And he called me, and I met with him, and we had a discussion. This was back in April of 2005 about the idea of creating an Arabic and Hebrew school, which later um, we were told by you know specialists in languages that we should focus on one language, and that would be Arabic. Uh, due to the fact that it's one of the most sought after languages in the world um, and that there was tons of federal funding um, to fund K-12 Arabic language instruction in the United States. How does it deal with religion, the school? The school is a secular school. It has absolutely nothing to do with religion. And unfortunately, the right-wing groups um, began to spin the school as a religious school. The school is a secular school offering the New York City curriculum and meeting the state and city standards that all New York City public schools um, are mandated to, you know, meet. And um, it was a school that was going to be teaching Arabic as a second language, as many other schools do across the city, across the country, and provide students with a better understanding of Arab culture and history. As you may know, anyone who seeks to learn a foreign language to be effective and proficient in that language, they need to know and understand the cultural nuances and the history of the people um, to use the language effectively without offending the natives of that language. How did you build support for the school in the years leading up to it? After I was approached in 2005, um, I began to do an informal feasibility study with members of the community in New York City, local politicians, clergy of all different faiths, and the Arab American community and getting them to see that this is an incredible opportunity to develop a school that would help people better understand the Arab culture, the Arab peoples. And in, um, in April, I think, or May of, uh, I think it was April of 2006, New Visions hosted uh, a meeting for the Arab American community where they pitched the idea. Um, and after pitching the idea to the community, basically saying, this is your opportunity, we would welcome such a school, now it's up to you to decide whether this is something you want to compete for. And as you know, the Bill Gates and Melinda Foundation um, provided money to New York City to create small new schools. So we were in a competition um, to get a $400,000 grant. So the community, Arab American community, engaged in a process to choose a social service organization um, that would be the lead partner of the school. And they also selected me to head spear, to spearhead um, this effort, um, as New Visions um, did in the first place. But I wanted the Arab American community to feel a sense of ownership and have a voice um, in the development of the school in terms of choosing the lead partnering agency, as well as leading, as well as you know, choosing the leader to head this um, project. Debbie, I want to we have to break, but when we come back, I want to play for you some clips of the uh, neoconservative uh, Daniel Pipes, one of the people who spearheaded the protest against you, um, and then talk about uh, why you ultimately stepped back, stepped down as the founding principal of the Halil Gibran School. After that, we will go to the issue of mountaintop removal. Stay with us. Drag lines at my heart, they're tearing us apart, and the mountain.